आप देख रहे हैं देश लाइव देश की आवाज Thank you Ms. Hasim and I now invite Mr. Tembeke Nukatobi to address the court. You have the floor sir. Madam President and distinguished members of the court, it is a privilege to appear before the court on behalf of South Africa. I will address Israel's genocidal intent. At this stage, the court is not required to determine that the only inference to be drawn from the available evidence is genocidal, to order provisional measures, as that is to decide the merits. Rather, the assessment of the existence of an intent to destroy could be made by the court only at the stage of the examination of the merits. that some of the alleged acts may also amount to atrocities other than genocide does not exclude the finding of plausible acts of genocide madam president south africa is not alone in drawing attention to israel's genocidal rhetoric against palestinians in gaza 15 United Nations special rapporteurs and 21 members of the United Nations working groups have warned that what is happening in Gaza reflects a genocide in the making and an overt intent to destroy the Palestinian people under occupation Israel has a genocidal intent against the Palestinians in Gaza. That is evident from the way in which Israel's military attack is being conducted, which has been described by Ms. Hassim SC. It is systematic in its character and form. The mass displacement of the population of Gaza headed into areas where they continue to be killed. and the deliberate creation of conditions that quote lead to a slow death and quote there is also the clear pattern of conduct the targeting of family homes and civilian infrastructure laying waste to vast areas of gaza and the bombing shelling and sniping of men women and children where they stand the destruction of the health infrastructure and lack of access to humanitarian assistance so much so that as we stand today 1% of the palestinian population in gaza has been systematically decimated and one in four gazans have been injured since 7 october these two elements alone are capable of evidencing israel's genocidal intent in relation to the whole or part of the Palestinian population in Gaza however third there is an extraordinary feature in this case that israel's political leaders military commanders and persons holding official positions have systematically and in explicit terms declared their genocidal intent and these statements are then repeated by soldiers on the ground in Gaza as they engage in the destruction of Palestinians and the physical infrastructure of Gaza we show this third element next israel's special genocidal intent is rooted in the belief that in fact the enemy is not just the military wing of hamas or indeed hamas generally but is embedded in the fabric of palestinian life in gaza on 7 october in a televised address israeli prime minister benjamin netanyahu declared war on gaza and i quote israel had started clearing out the communities that have been infiltrated by terrorists and he warned of an unprecedented price to be paid by the enemy 
There are more than 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza. Israel is the occupying power in control of Gaza. It controls entry, exit, and the internal movements of inside Gaza. And qua Prime Minister, Mr. Netanyahu exercises overall command over the Israeli Defense Force and in turn, the Palestinians in Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu, in his address to the Israeli forces on 28 October 2023, preparing for the invasion of Gaza, urged the soldiers to remember what Amalek has done to you. This refers to the biblical command by God to Saul for the retaliatory destruction of an entire group of people known as the Amalekites, put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. The genocidal invocation to Amalek was anything but idle. It was repeated by Mr. Netanyahu in a letter to the Israeli Armed Forces on 3 November 2023. Madam President, let the Prime Minister's words speak for themselves. Has done to you, says our Holy Bible, and we do remember and we are fighting our brave troops and combatants who are now in Gaza or around Gaza. And in The Deputy Speaker of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, has called for the erasure of the Gaza, Gaza Strip from the face of the earth. The Defense Force agrees. On 9 October, the Defense Minister, Yoav Gallant, gave a situation update to the army, where he said that as Israel was imposing a complete siege on Gaza, there would be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything would be closed because Israel is fighting human animals. <coughs> Speaking to troops on the Gaza border, he instructed them that he has released all the restraints and that Gaza won't return to what it was before. We will eliminate everything we will reach all places. Eliminate everything, reach all places without any restraints. The theme of destruction of human animals was reiterated by an Israeli army coordinator of government activities in the territories on 9 October 2023, who, in an address to Hamas and the residents of Gaza, stated that Hamas has become ISIS and that the citizens of Gaza are celebrating instead of being horrified. He concluded that human animals are dealt with accordingly. Israel has imposed a total blockade on Gaza. No electricity, no water, just damage. You wanted hell, you will get hell. The language of systematic dehumanization is evident here. Human animals. Both Hamas and civilians are condemned. Within the Israeli cabinet, this is also a widely held view. The Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, Israel Katz, called for the denial of water and fuel, as this is what will happen to a people of children killers and slaughterers. This admits of no ambiguity. It means to create conditions of death of the Palestinian people in Gaza. To die a slow death because of starvation and dehydration, or to die quickly because of a bomb attack or snipers, but to die nevertheless. In fact, Heritage Minister Amichai Eliyahu said that Israel must find ways for Gazans that are more painful than death. It is no answer to say that neither are in command of the army. 
They are ministers in the Israeli government. They vote in the Knesset and are in a position to shape state policy. The intent to destroy Gaza has been nurtured at the highest levels of state. As President Isaac Herzog has joined the ranks of those signing bombs destined for Gaza. Having previously noted that the entire population in Gaza is responsible and that this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved, is absolutely not true. We will fight until we break their backbone. Later attempts by the president and others to neutralize this speech have not altered the sting of his words, which was to tar all Palestinians as responsible for the actions of Hamas. Nor, as I will show below, has it affected how state policy is understood within government. The Minister of National Security repeated the President's statements that Hamas and civilians are responsible in equal measure. On 10 November 2023, in a televised interview, he stated that when we say that Hamas should be destroyed, it also means those who celebrate, those who support, and those who hand out candy. They are all terrorists, and they should also be destroyed. These are orders to destroy and to maim what cannot be destroyed. These statements are not open to neutral interpretations or after the fact rationalizations and reinterpretations by Israel. The statements were made by persons in command of the state. They communicated state policy. It is simple. If the statements were not intended, they would not have been made. The genocidal intent behind these statements is not ambiguous to the Israeli soldiers on the ground. Indeed, it is directing their actions and objectives. On 7 December 2023, Israeli soldiers proved that they understood the Prime Minister's message to remember what the Amalek has done to you as genocidal. They were recorded by journalists dancing and singing. We know our motto, there are no uninvolved, that they obey one commandment, to wipe off the seed of Amalek. The Prime Minister's invocation of Amalek is being used by soldiers to justify the killing of civilians, including children. These are the soldiers repeating the inciting words of their Prime Minister. Israeli soldiers in Gaza were filmed dancing, chanting, and singing in November. May their village burn, may Gaza be erased. There is now a trend among the soldiers to film themselves committing atrocities against civilians in Gaza in a form of snuff video. One recorded himself detonating over 50 houses in Shujaiya. Other soldiers were recorded singing we will destroy all of Khan Yunus and this house. We will blow it up for you and for everything you do for us. These are the soldiers putting into effect their command. Thank you. 
חברה 828, אומרת את זה, יהיה שלום. מדהים. 30 בתים, גדוד 749. כאן התחיל הניצחון. עם ישראל חי. The commanders of the army are also of the same mind. Israeli army commander Yair Ben David has stated that the army had done in Beit Hanon and did there as Shimon and Levi did in Nablus, and that the entire Gaza should resemble Beit Hanon. Israeli soldier Yeshai Shalev published a video against the backdrop of the ruins of what was the site of Al-Azhar University with the caption, once upon a time, there was a university in Gaza and in practice, a school for murderers and human animals. Soldiers obviously believe that this language and their actions are acceptable because the destruction of Palestinian life in Gaza is articulated state policy. Senior political and military officials encouraged without censure the 95-year-old Israeli army reservist, Ezra Yachin, a veteran of the Deir Yassin massacre against the Palestinians in 1948, to speak to the soldiers ahead of the ground invasion in Gaza. In his tour, he echoed the same sentiment while being driven around in an officially Israeli army vehicle dressed in Israeli army fatigue, I quote, be triumphant and finish them off and don't leave anyone behind. Erase the memory of them, erase them, their families, mothers and children. These animals can no longer live if you have an Arab neighbor, don't wait, go to his home and shoot him. We want to invade, not like before. We want to enter and destroy what's in front of us and destroy houses, then destroy the one after it. With all of our forces, complete destruction, enter and destroy. As you can see, we will witness things we've never dreamed of. Let, the, let them drop bombs on them and erase them. As recently as 7 January 2024, a video of a soldier was posted online where he boasts that the enemy had destroyed the entire village of Hibat Azar. For two weeks, he said, they had worked hard to bomb the village and executed their mandate. Any suggestion that senior politicians did not mean what they said, much less that the meaning was not understood by soldiers in Gaza, would be without any merit. The scale of destruction in Gaza, the mass targeting of family homes and civilians, the war being a war on children, all make clear that genocidal intent is both understood and is being put into practice. The articulated intent is the destruction of Palestinian life in all its manifestations. The genocidal rhetoric is also commonplace within the Israeli Knesset. Members of the Ken Knesset have repeatedly called for Gaza to be, to be wiped out, flattened, erased, and crushed on all its inhabitants. They have deplored anyone feeling sorry for the uninvolved Gazans, asserting repeatedly that there are no uninvolved that there are no innocents in Gaza, that the killers of the women and children should not be separated from the citizens of Gaza, and that the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves, and that there should be one sentence for everyone there, death. Finally, the lawmakers have called for mercilessly bombing from the air, with some advocating for the use of nuclear doomsday weapons and a Nakba that will overshadow the Nakba of 48. The Prime Minister's genocidal speech has gained ground among some elements of civil society. A famous singer has repeated Mr. Netanyahu's Amalek reference, stating that Gaza must be wiped out 
and be destroyed with every Amalek seed. We simply must destroy all of Gaza and exterminate everyone who is there. Another has called to erase Gaza, not leave a single person there. Journalists and commentators have announced that the woman is an enemy, the baby is an enemy, the pregnant woman is an enemy. That it is necessary to turn the strip into a slaughterhouse, to demolish every house our soldiers come across. Exterminate everyone. The intentional failure of the government of Israel to condemn, prevent, and punish such genocidal incitement constitutes in itself a grave violation of the Genocide Convention. We should recall, Madam President, that in Article 1 of the Convention, Israel confirmed that genocide, whether committed in time of peace or in time of war, is a crime under international law. And it undertook to prevent and to punish it as such. This failure to prevent, condemn, and punish such speech by the government has served to normalize genocidal rhetoric and extreme danger for Palestinians within Israeli society. As M.K. Moshe Sada from the Likud party has said, the government's own attorneys share his views that Palestinians in Gaza must be destroyed. I quote, you go anywhere and they tell you to destroy them. In the kibbutz, they tell you to destroy them. My friends at the state attorney's office who fought with me on political issues in debate said to me, it is clear that we need to destroy all Gazans. Destroy all Gazans. Israel is aware of its destruction of Palestinian life and infrastructure. Despite this knowledge, it has maintained and indeed intensified its military activity in Gaza. As to full awareness, in the week after 7 October, NGOs and the United Nations warned of an unprecedented humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The UN stated that actors must allow humanitarian teams and goods to immediately and safely reach the hundreds of thousands of people in need. So right from the beginning, Israel knew that it was depriving water, food, electricity, and essentials for survival. It said so. Everything is closed. It has known that it was depriving Palestinians of health care and treatment for injury in the middle of an unprecedented bombardment of food and water and of other essentials for survival. This prompted the World Health Organization to say, we are on our knees asking for sustained, scaled up, protected humanitarian operations, appealing to all those in a situation to make a decision or influence decision makers to give us the humanitarian space to address this human catastrophe. Despite this knowledge, Israel continues to target infrastructure essential for survival. Water and sanitation infrastructure, solar panels, bakeries, mills, crops. It bombs hospitals, decimating the healthcare system. It targets aid workers and the infrastructure of the United Nations. It is because of the policy of Israel that Gaza has become a place of death and despair. In conclusion, Madam President, many propagators of grave atrocities have protested that they were misunderstood, <coughs> that they did not mean what they said, and that their own words were taken out of context. What state would admit to a genocidal intent? Yet, the distinctive feature of this case has not been the silence as such, but the reiteration and repetition of genocidal speech throughout every sphere of state in Israel. We remind the court 
of the identity and authority of the genocidal inciters. The Prime Minister, the President, the Minister of Defense, the Minister of National Security, the Minister of Energy and Infrastructure, members of the Knesset, senior army officials, and foot soldiers. Genocidal utterances are therefore not out in the fringes. They are embodied in state policy. The intent to destroy is plainly understood by soldiers on the ground. It is also fully understood by some within the Israeli society, with the government facing criticism for allowing in any aid to Gaza on the basis that it is recanting on its promise to starve Palestinians. Any suggestion that Israeli officials did not mean what they said or were not fully understood by soldiers and civilians alike to mean what they said should be rejected by this court. The evidence of genocidal intent is not only chilling, it is also overwhelming and incontrovertible. Madam President, it is now my honor to request you to call Mr. John Dugat on the subject of jurisdiction. I thank Mr. Ngutkai Toby, and I now invite Professor John Dugard to take the floor. You have the floor, Professor. Madam President, distinguished members of the court, it is a great privilege to appear before you today on behalf of the Republic of South Africa. In my speech, I will address the question of jurisdiction. The people of South Africa and of Israel both have a history of suffering. Both states have become parties to the Genocide Convention in the determination to end suffering. In this spirit, neither has attached a reservation to Article 9 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. It is in terms of this convention dedicated to saving humanity that South Africa brings this dispute before the court. <coughs> the prohibition on Genocide is a peremptory norm. Obligations under the Genocide Convention are ergo omnes, obligations owed to the international community as a whole. States parties to this convention are obliged not only to desist from genocidal acts, but also to prevent them. That the obligation of state parties to prevent acts of genocide is the foundation of the convention is clear from its placement in Article 1 of the Convention. <coughs> Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes it clear that state parties are guardians of the Genocide Convention. Unlike other treaties designed to protect human rights, it does not oblige states to pursue negotiations as a prelude to approaching this court. It does not treat the ending of genocidal acts as a bilateral affair between states. Instead, it envisages a situation in which a state, acting on behalf of the international community as a whole, seizes the jurisdiction of the court as a matter of urgency to prevent genocide. South Africa has a long history of close relations with Israel. For this reason, it did not bring the dispute immediately to the attention of the court. It watched with horror as Israel responded to the terrible atrocities committed against its people on 7 of October, with an attack on Gaza that resulted in the indiscriminate killing of innocent Palestinian civilians, most of whom were women and children. The South African government repeatedly voiced its concerns in the Security Council and in public statements 
that Israel's actions had become genocidal. On 10 November, in a formal diplomatic day march, it informed Israel that while it condemned the actions of Hamas, it wanted the International Criminal Court to investigate the leadership of Israel for international crimes, including genocide. As the court will know, the definition of genocide in the Rome Statute repeats that of the Genocide Convention. On 17 October, South Africa referred Israel's commission of the crime of genocide to the International Criminal Court for, quote, vigorous investigation, unquote. In announcing this decision, President Ramaphosa publicly expressed his abhorrence for what is happening right now in Gaza, which is now turned into a concentration camp where genocide is taking place. To accuse a state of committing acts of genocide and to condemn it in such strong language is a major act on the part of a state. At this stage, it became clear that there was a serious dispute between South Africa and Israel, which would end only with the end of Israel's genocidal acts. South Africa repeated this accusation at a meeting of BRICS on 21 November and at an emergency special session of the United Nations General Assembly on 12 December. No response from Israel was forthcoming. None was necessary. By this time, the dispute had crystallized as a matter of law. This was confirmed by Israel's official and unequivocal denial on 6 December that it was committing genocide in Gaza. However, as a matter of courtesy, before filing the present application, on 21 December, South Africa sent a note verbal to the Embassy of Israel to reiterate its view that Israel's acts of genocide in Gaza amounted to genocide, that it as a state party to the Genocide Convention was under an obligation to prevent genocide from being committed. Israel responded by way of a note for Mal that failed to address the issues raised by South Africa in its note and neither affirmed nor denied the existence of a dispute. <coughs> This was emailed later on the 27th of December. This note was received by the relevant South African team on the 29th of December after the present application was filed. On 4 January, South Africa replied to this note verbal, highlighting Israel's failure to prevent any response to the matters raised by South Africa over the previous months, as reiterated in its note verbal. South Africa made it clear that given Israel's ongoing conduct against Palestinians in Gaza, the dispute re referred to in its note verbal of 21 December remained unresolved and was plainly not capable of resolution by way of a bilateral meeting. Nevertheless, South Africa proposed a meeting on 5 January, again out of courtesy. Israel responded to this note verbal by proposing that we reconnect to coordinate a meeting at the earliest opportunity after the close of hearings in the present case. To this, South Africa understandably replied that such a meeting would serve no purpose. Madam President, these notes verbal are all to be found in the judge's folder. The existence of a dispute is a matter to be determined by an objective determination of the facts, as they existed at the time of the filing of the application. At this time, South Africa had already accused Israel in the Security Council the General Assembly and other public fora 
of engaging in genocidal acts. It had conducted a diplomatic day march on Israel, warning it that it viewed its conduct as genocidal. It had requested the International Criminal Court to vigorously investigate crimes under the Genocide Convention committed by Israel in the Gaza Strip, and it accused Israel inter alia of the deliberate targeting of civilians, intentionally causing starvation and impeding relief supplies. It had accused Israel leaders of expressing, quote, the intent of committing genocide. Israel had flatly denied South Africa's accusations. <coughs> Despite these harsh accusations, Israel has persisted in its genocidal acts against the population of Gaza. What more evidence could be required to establish a dispute? It is precisely because of a situation of this kind affecting the international community as a whole that Article 9 of the Genocide Convention does not require negotiations as a precondition to seizing the jurisdiction of the court. Certainly, a respondent state cannot prevent a referral to the court by claiming that there is no dispute and that it wants discussions on this matter when the existence of the dispute is clear. For a state to insist on a time frame for negotiations would simply be a license to commit genocide and would run counter to the object and purpose of the, Geneva, of the Genocide Convention. Madam President, the question of the crystallization of a dispute has been addressed by this court in preliminary objections at the merit stage where the burden of proof is higher. Although the court has generally adopted a flexible approach to the subject, it has laid down a number of tests for the existence of a dispute. First, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. Second, the date for determining the existence of the dispute is the date of the application, but subsequent conduct may be considered. Three, whether the dispute exists must be determined by an objective determination of the facts. And four, a dispute exists when it is demonstrated on the basis of the evidence that the respondent was aware or could not have been unaware that its views were positively opposed. When these propositions are applied to the facts of this case, it is incontrovertible that a dispute exists between South Africa and Israel. South Africa strongly believes that what Israel is doing in Gaza amounts to genocide. Israel denies this and claims that such an accusation is legally and factually wrong and, moreover, is obscene. So an objective determination of the facts shows that a dispute existed on the date of the submission of South Africa's application, and this has been confirmed by Israel's subsequent statements and by its continuing conduct in Gaza. Moreover, Israel must have been aware from South Africa's public statements, the demarche, and the referral of the matter to the International Criminal Court of Israel's genocidal acts that a dispute existed between the two states. Madam President, the court has indicated that in an application for provisional measures, it is sufficient to show that there is a prima facie basis for jurisdiction. It is submitted that South Africa has convincingly established the existence of a dispute between it and Israel over the fulfillment 
of the latter's obligations under the Genocide Convention. Finally, it is submitted that regard should be had to the special considerations that apply to the existence of a dispute under Article 9 of the Genocide Convention between a state that brings an application in furtherance of its obligation to prevent genocide and a state accused of committing genocide. This, this concludes my speech, Madam President. I thank you, the members of the court, for your attention. I now ask you to call to the podium Professor Max to proceed to address you on the nature of the rights requiring protection and the link between such rights and the, and the measures requested. Thank you. I thank you, Professor Dugard. Before I give the floor to the next speaker, the court will observe a coffee break of 10 minutes. Sitting is adjourned. और दुनिया की तमाम छोटी और बड़ी खबरों के लिए हमारे चैनल को सब्सक्राइब करना न भूलें और बेल का बटन जरूर दबाएं।